Salam everyone, I am your host Naid Jahed and welcome to 2T's new show, Culturally Incorrect. On today's episode, we're going straight into Afghan marriage. And oh boy, as someone who was once married to another Afghan, I have some interesting viewpoints. So let's be real, marriage can be challenging, especially when we add a rich and complex culture like ours to the mix. That, in my opinion, is what makes Afghan marriages even more challenging. From engagement rituals to actual wedding planning, it can be a lot to deal with before you've even made it down the aisle for the Astaburo. But rituals and parties aside, the real test begins after the I do's. Afghan marriages can be a difficult journey because of so many cultural expectations, responsibilities, and obligations. Now that also goes for Afghans who've married someone outside of our culture, although there are different challenges there. So when it comes to wedding rituals and marriage, do Afghans have it harder than others? Well, it would be impossible to measure, but I dare say our marriage dynamics are amongst the toughest I've heard of. Maybe it was easier for our parents and grandparents' generations in Afghanistan. Back then, the community and culture seemed to reinforce the foundation of marriage in a more wholesome and healthy way. Today, though, we live in a vastly different reality when it comes to Afghan marriage rituals and dynamics. For one, we're trying to uphold old customs that worked in the old world, but not in the new one. And along the way, we've invented some new rituals that never existed in Afghanistan. Two, Technology and social media have caused huge shifts in how we communicate and interact. Unfortunately, it also influences our expectations of what our marriage should look like. Before, it was keeping up with the Joneses. Now, it's keeping up with the Kardashians and your 700 Instagram friends. And three, marriage is being delayed throughout the world and Afghans in the West are not immune to that. How common was it that people in our parents' generation got married in their late teens or early 20s? That's certainly not common nowadays. As you can see, there are a lot of factors that are involved when we talk about Afghan marriage. Some of them are uniquely Afghan, while others are universal. So we have a lot to discuss, and here to dig deeper are our wonderful panelists. Back with us in our studio is Dr. Noi John Nasrat, who holds a master's and a PhD in clinical psychology. She is a professor at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology in Washington, DC. Her clinical manual for mental health professionals who work with Afghan refugees has won numerous awards. Also returning with us is Dr. Roslyn John Rogers, who's a psychologist specializing in refugee mental health and trauma. She holds a PhD in international psychology and is a licensed mental health counselor with over 10 years of clinical experience. And last but definitely not least, via video again, is Dr. Faid John Yunus, a well-known Islamic studies scholar, author, and researcher. He holds a PhD in international and multicultural education from the University of San Francisco. He's also a retired professor of cultural anthropology of the Middle East and Islamic philosophy. All three of our brilliant guests today are of Afghan and Afghan American heritage. Thank you all for joining us. We would like to get started with Dr. Yunus. Dr. Yunus, let's go back to the beginning. Based on stories I've heard from my parents and older family members, engagements and weddings in Afghanistan from the 1970s and earlier were much simpler and often smaller events. Why has everything changed so drastically? Well, um, my understanding from a sociological point of view is this, that um, uh, if you talk about United States, people become very uh, materialistic uh, because people made more money, uh, they have uh, different means, and uh, this, of course, uh, with uh, American involvement in Afghanistan uh, for 20 years, uh, Afghans become more materialistic, and uh, that's my reason. Yeah. Otherwise, yes, uh, 
I'm old enough to say that the engagement was very simple yeah. uh, in Afghanistan in the 60s, uh, that I was a young fellow. Yeah. And, but now it's totally different, even in the United States, uh, an engagement party is like a, like a wedding. So and, with, um, more, with more elaborate and more expensive Afghan engagement and wedding rituals, do you think that we're going against Islamic values? Uh, we certainly do, because um, uh, according to Islam and Islamic culture, uh, the beauty is simplicity. Uh, the less expenses, the better. Uh, actually, as you know, I just respectfully remind you that the Quran highly condemn extravagance, that people should be spending very moderately, you know. And, um, and the Prophet, for example, said that the lowest the mahr, uh, the, the, the better. But now we witness that uh, up to $200,000 they, they put aside for mahr and, and no one even think that is that possible, <laughs> that a man could pay that eventually. Right. So it's all a kind of, uh, I see it as a show off, mm -hmm. not a real, uh, not a real yeah. engagement for, for happiness and prosperity in the future. Thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Nasrat, I'm not an expert in this field, uh, nor do I have any exact numbers, but it just seems to me that the Afghan divorce rate in America mm. is pretty high. Um, I would love to know, do you think that I'm right about this? And do you have an actual percentage of divorce rates amongst mm. our community? It is unfortunately very high. Uh, it's more anecdotal rather than based on uh, empirical statistics and, um, and, and, and research. Um, and for some reason, I checked out actually the census, the last census, and there was no mention of it, uh, the divorce rate of Afghans. There are a lot of census about Af Afghans living in the United States. I think that um, you know also divorce is uh, also uh, ma in, in many ways on the rise. You know, you talked about the uh, wedding and why it is so being basically celebrated so lavishly. First of all, I think I'm going to connect the two. I'm trying to right. connect the two because it's very ironical that we reject certain aspects of the Western, but then assume some not so good and very helpful ways of the Western culture, right? So we live in a very um, capitalistic society where everything becomes a product. Wedding's a product, you know, death is a product, and they, they just celebrate or they just grieve and so on. So, unfortunately, because of the lack of a, a, a really deeper uh, self-awareness, we subscribe to the ways of lavish, mm -hmm. you know, celebration, which mm -hmm. basically is not representative, as Dr. Yuna said, of our culture, our religion, and so on. Mm -hmm. So, I think it's the uh, issue that now women have more, uh, there is a rule of, of law. Mm -hmm. You know, if there, of course, I'm not saying that every person who has not been treated by their spouses will go and end up in a divorce uh, or actually file for a divorce and so on. But I think they actually see that they have rights. There is also economic sustainability and they're, they're also, uh, in, uh, they are gaining education and, mm -hmm. and, and jobs. And so they can afford actually their own life. Mm -hmm. Based on your experience, what do you think are the leading causes of divorce amongst Afghan couples? What do you think they're doing wrong when it comes to marriage? <laughs> they don't actually listen to each other once, but there's also the very uh, mismatches, I think, mm -hmm. um, because of these issues that we have been talking all day long, right? In terms of being forced into these marriages and finding out that that's actually not a good fit for me. That's mm -hmm. not a good match. This is not where my heart lies, mm -hmm. right? I'm just doing it for others and not for my my own sake and then of course that you know marriage is all about growing is about growth you know there is they may have been in love and they may have loved each other but after five years and so we know in psychology in marital relationship and so on field of psychology every five years there is a crisis in the marriage right mm. so after the third or fourth year then you're gonna be okay but even that is not a guarantee right, right. so because every five year we grow we grow up spiritually, uh, emotionally, physically, and uh, we become mature. So be just because of that, our own personal growth, mm -hmm. we may not be seeing our partner from the same lens. Mm -hmm. Not because we have changed at mm -hmm. all. In fact, uh, they have gone into a different kind of journey, so to speak. Right. 
I feel that um, when it comes to the Afghan community, Afghan women uh, face a lot more of a stigma when it comes to divorce than Afghan men. Um, Dr. Rogers, I would like to start with you. Do you agree with this? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yes. Um, and why do you think that is? And, and I think that um, historically, I think that's, it's, you know, it's been there. It's kind of like the old spinstress, you know, those stories from, um, from other cultures and other times. Um, but I think that um, it carries on from, you know, the patriarchal um, standards that are placed on us um, and the, you know, the honor that we're supposed to carry uh, for mm. the family. What is it, you know, what is it, um, what kind of reflection is it on the family that, you know, she wasn't able to stay married. Um, so, I mean, I've heard this, you know, uh, many times, and I'm sure um, you have too. Um, and I think that, um, as Dr. Nasrat said, I think that women um, are, uh, particularly in the West, are, are, are starting to um, grow out of those uh, stereotypes and those mm -hmm. standards. Um, and because we're having these conversations more mm -hmm. um, amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, it, it's empowering in a way, mm -hmm. right? That we don't, you know, we might have gotten into the situation that we're finding unfulfilling, but we have an option. Mm -hmm. um, and um, taking that is a huge, it's a huge, I, I think it's mm -hmm. the, one of the bravest things, um, particularly with the backlash that may come mm -hmm. afterwards. And I think it's extremely brave, um, right. but it's the right thing to do, obviously. If, it's, if you're unhappy. Dr. Yunus, what is your perspective on this? When it comes to stigma, do you think that Afghan women who are divorced face more of a stigma than Afghan men who are divorced? And why do you think that is? Well, um, the first thing is that um, there is a hadith of the Prophet that um, uh, discourage divorce in our culture uh, and, um, and because of that uh, there is a mis misinterpretation of that hadith that they totally abandon women to ask for divorce while in Islamic Sharia or Islamic law as they call it here uh, women are allowed to ask for divorce mm. so that's that's one thing and also we need to go to the origin of marriage most of Afghan marriages they are my understanding is in the last 35 years is on the wrong reason they married for the wrong reason right. okay <laughs> they married because as i said earlier they they married because of uh, he has a job and he has a good uh, reputation or he is an engineer or he's a doctor but uh, and, and these are the wrong reasons for marriage uh, mm -hmm. and interference of families men are very controlling mm -hmm. Um, you know, women, as uh, both professors mentioned, uh, they are now very independent. Mm -hmm. And one thing that um, I did a, a small research and published uh, a few years ago that in Afghan culture in America, more men uh, are, are, men are less educated that, than mm. girls. And uh, uh, this pa this work I did um, it was not. I didn't have a chance to publish it, but I did the research. More girls are more educated than than mm. uh, than uh, young guys, and still they marry their own Afghan. But that uh, level of education and understanding of the system, and some of women make more money even than than that of their husbands. So you're you're referring to Afghan women being more educated than Afghan men when it comes to De the Western world. Definitely. Definitely, mm. they are more educated, and uh, and uh, uh, I have witnessed several cases in the court of law in in in, in Northern California that uh, they both came to this country. The husband did not do anything, even did not learn uh, 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 communicating English, but she went to school. And now she makes a lot of money. Mm. She even purchased her home and all that. And uh, this uh, this caused a lot of problem, and and um, because he can't tolerate that. Well, he had the same opportunity to do the same thing, and even single girls, because right. parents were very protective, over protective mm. of their girls, and then their 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 uh, boys. Boys were going out in the mm -hmm. evening; they were dating and this and that, but not girls. Right. So what girls did? They went to school. In yeah. six years, they have a master degree. Right. right, 
and that 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 young man does not have anything and but sometimes they over bypass this issue and they still marry but that's the wrong reason and um, and uh, and also uh, alcoholism also plays a major role in afghan families mm. uh, my experience that uh, many afghan men and they are uh, um, they, they resort when they have some problems they resort to alcohol right. and then they become addicted Right. So that's also an issue that we need yeah. to brought up in this show. Dr. Nastat, when you when we're talking about this stigma uh, that divorced women who are Afghan um, are more often faced with than Afghan men who are divorced, where do you think that stigma stems from? And do you agree that there is a stigma? Absolutely. I think that we blame women for whatever, even if they, that's not their fault. We, you know, as Dr. Yunus mentioned earlier, um, the, you know, the definition, good attributes of an Afghan woman is what? That she is calm, mm -hmm. that she is uh, kind of agreeable. Uh, agreeable and so on. So that means if you went through hell and you kind of somehow got really uh, uh, lucky to get, come out of it, you're still gonna be blamed because you were not agreeable mm -hmm. enough. So you did not do your social duty to be a very good and submissive wife, mm -hmm. right? Whereas we know this, it takes only two, two, Tango, right? It's mm -hmm. never one person or the other. I also would like to mention that you asked me about statistics. Most divorces are filed by females in the United States, anecdotally speaking. Why do you think that is? Because of the fact that now they realize their, their, their rights and they know that mm -hmm. they have that right and so on. Because as Dr. Yunus mentioned, if men are less educated, why would they get rid of <laughs> educated and earning a woman who was actually earning money and bringing money and mm -hmm. food to the, to the dinner uh, table, right? So that, that's also something that they um, take um, they have more liberation, I guess, freedom mm -hmm. to do that. And, and divorce is very nasty, and I know mm -hmm. that's very, very painful for, especially when there are kids involved, and a lot of women do not want to get out of it because of the, the, the idea of that it's better for the kids. Mm -hmm. But we know to be in a toxic relationship is much more worse for kids than Absolutely. staying there. Okay. Dr. Rogers, based on what you've seen, I would love to know what role you think social media plays um, on the pressure that Afghans feel when it comes to the expectations of their own engagement parties, weddings, and marriages? Yeah, it's um, an interesting question. Um, and I think uh, there definitely we need more research on it. <laughs> um, but um, I think that, um, you know, I've been thinking back to when I was younger and, and already in such a short time, there's been such a huge change, uh, you know, compared to when I was younger and going to Afghan weddings or, you know, babies being born or, um, you know, I mean, even for a child being born, which is a wonderful, blessed event. I'm not, you know, um, downplaying that, but it is almost like this huge event where, I mean, like literally you walk in, like I feel underdressed if I'm wearing just like a spring dress, like everyone's decked out. Um, and so I think that that came before actually social media. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I think social media has just kind of exaggerated even more because we have to take pictures and we have to post it online and outdo the previous marriage that was, you know, a big deal <laughs> on social media. Um, so I think that it's self-imposed, honestly. Um, I think that we've been doing this and I don't know uh, when it took, it took hold. Maybe it was just kind of a generation of being here in the U.S. and accruing material mm -hmm. wealth and being able to do that. Okay. Um, but I think it definitely came before social media, right? for sure. <laughs> Dr. Yunus, so the marriage rate in America is tumbling downwards, and according to Pew Research, around 50% of millennials in this country, which are people between the age of 27 and 42, are not married, uh, with most not even really believing in marriage. Uh, considering marriage is such a central part of religion, how do you see this impacting faith among the Muslims and Afghans who are in that group? Um, and let's say some of them never get married. Would they be considered to be bad Muslims? No, they are not uh, considered to be bad Muslims uh, uh, because um, marriage in Islam is a sunnah, is a tradition of the Prophet, or, although it's a very emphasized uh, mm -hmm. tradition that the Prophet uh, 
uh, peace be upon him, uh, emphasized that that people should marry. Uh, but uh, it's a sunnah. Sunnah means it's not farce. It's mm. not mandatory. There are some women or men that they may have some issues, uh, health issues, uh, career issues, and a lot of other issues that uh, they may choose to stay single. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, they, they have a choice. Uh, but of course, uh, in our culture, um, uh, marriage uh, highly emphasized, and they push their girls to marry, and they push their um, sons to marry, right? Because they want to see their grandchildren. They want to see the extension of the family. Um, and for that, uh, and some of them uh, accept that, some of them don't. But uh, from an Islamic point of view, again, it is highly emphasized to marry, but at the same time, it's a sunnah, it's not farce, it's not mandatory, it's it's not obligatory. Uh, people can stay uh, single, men and women, and they can live in a separate, separate apartment or, mm -hmm. or apartment complex if they want to. I mean, as, as far as I understand Islam, it gives you total freedom and freedom of choice. If you want to, if one wants to go under the influence of culture and taboo of culture and what, as we discussed uh, uh, earlier about Mardum Chimigan or what people say, that's a different issue. But people have two choices. Perfect. I um, really appreciate this point. I think what's really be, needs to be distinguished is between Islam and culture, right? Yes. So culture can be like thousands of years of in Islam as well. However, we equate now Islam with culture, mm -hmm. and that's also come from vulnerability because we don't we're not well versed in our own uh, Islamic view. Once we study it, then we can actually understand what Islam is. And I couldn't agree with Dr. Yunus more than that. That you know, Islam is such an beautiful, uh, beautiful religion when you actually go deeper and study it but we put all these cultural nuances and make it like a little mm. blur out of it and then call it the Afghan culture right. we need to educate ourselves if we really wanted to improve ourselves and improve our society and family right dr. Rogers a majority of Afghans that I know marry other Afghans, almost 99.9% .9 of them. Marrying outside of our culture is frowned upon by some families, although that's definitely changing in today's times. In my marriage, um, our Afghan culture was probably the only thing that really drew us together. Otherwise, we could not have been more different. Uh, but I wanted to hear your perspective on whether you think Afghans are too focused on marrying other Afghans. Uh, yeah, good question. I don't think it's too focused. I think that um, particularly in the context of, um, you know, the instability in Afghanistan um, and kind of the culture changing so much um, that I think there is a legitimate um, uh, wanting to hold on and preserve our culture. And the way that you do that is, you know, through marriage, right? Mm. Um, and, and keeping the, our language alive. And, and I, I have the utmost respect for that. And I, and I, and I see the importance of it as well. Um, and so um, I understand the overall thinking um, behind that. Um, however, I um, also empathize with people who don't necessarily um, that's not important to them, for mm -hmm. example. Um, and they meet someone who does meet, you know, match their values um, and, you know, have grown together and want to grow, continue to grow together. And I think that that's, you know, that should be okay with them. I think that, um, yeah, so I think it's a balance, it's a balance, you know, and I think it's obviously a personal preference um, of what's really important. Um, and, you know, I mean, in my own, you know, in my own family, um, I can honestly say that I look back, you know, being half my father being American, my mom being Afghan, that, you know, I wish that I, I had, um, uh, more opportunities when I'm growing up to really learn Farsi better, right? Mm -hmm. So that's like something that I, I wish was there and that I, you know, I hope that eventually, you know, might be passed down, you know, to my children. So I think that is important. Um, however, um, again, personal preferences um, and um, yeah, so I mean, that's kind of all right. I have to. Dr. Yeah. Yunus, are Afghans free to marry non, a non-Muslim without the other person converting? Um, ninety-nine percent no. Ninety-nine. Uh, Why ninety-nine percent no? Because that's my experience. That uh, that uh, 
uh, since uh, since uh, since Islam does not allow to to marry a non-Muslim, so 99 percent because because the majority or they want to marry, but then there is there is a there is a this is issue that they can't marry non-Muslims unless they convert. One percent because they do civil marriage, and and uh, once uh, or twice or three times they came to me. So what if he's not converting? I said, well, the only solution is to go into civil uh, court and then marry according to civil law of this country. But uh, don't sit into a nikah. That is a kind of hypocrisy because when you do nikah, uh, you, that means that you live according to Islamic. Uh, uh, rules and values and principles, and that's what Neko is. Neko is not just bond two two persons together, but if you want to live quote unquote on a secular basis, why not? This you you have free choice and you have freedom to do whatever you like, but do a civil marriage in the court of law. But the majority of Afghans. Uh, uh, they have this. Uh, some girls do have this problem uh, th that uh, they meet somebody, and and then this issue of uh, marriage comes, and then they ask them to convert, and and uh, some of them convert, some of them don't convert. We have some cases that they, they, the other fellow did not con convert mm -hmm. to Islam. So um, uh, it is it is a challenge for many families because most families do not accept that at all. I mean, the majority yeah. of families do not accept this. Dr. My Nistrat, experience. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with Dr. Yunus? And, well, to some degree, yes. I, I don't. I'm not an Islamic scholar. Obviously, I don't claim to be, and that's outside of my competency. I think that there is a psychological reason for that. So people would like to stay in in group, right? A, a, a culture survives when is uh, there are cultural diversity, but homogeneity, right? Homogeneity basically being the same, right? Think like me, be like me, speak the same language, do things like me. The minute an outsider comes in, it threatens the homogeneity and solidarity and cohesion of that uh, nuclear family, the society, and as a whole, the culture. So th the, for that reason, heterogeneity is kind of being seen as uh, changing the culture, especially when a girl brings a non-Muslim man, right? So that means like, my goodness, so that's it. Mm -hmm. But we allow actually uh, Muslim men to bring non-Muslim. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that true? I'm not sure. Maybe we should, doc we should ask Dr. Uh, Dr. Yunus. So it's not looked down upon. Have you noticed that? So unless the, 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 the lady or the, the Afghan woman brings somebody, I think that is more sociological, psychological uh, kind of reasons for that, why they are frowned upon. But it's not so much about, I also, would believe that if somebody is really subscribing to the Muslim faith, then why is that that? Dr. Yunus, why is it that Afghan men are allowed to marry non-Muslims, but Afghan women are not? Well, there's a verse, uh, there's a verse in the Quran that you could marry uh, Jews and Christians. Um, uh, that verse is for men, that men can, uh, because uh, as you know, uh, Marriage is a, is a process of exogamy. So uh, a girl exit from her household and don't join the family. So um, uh, they allow men to marry, to marry uh, Jews and Christians because there's a clear verse about that, that you can marry the people of the book, uh, but they do not allow girls uh, to, to uh, marry a non-Muslim because what is because the reason for that? The main, the main reason is that um, is Muslims believe that Islam is the final message of God. And it's a completed message. And, um, and because this is a completed message, so God presented Tawheed, the philosophy of Tawheed, to humanity. And that means oneness of God and humans and nature and, and, and uh, knowledge. So uh, since they believe that this is the final message, so a girl grew up in a monoth pure monotheistic religion. Uh, they don't allow her, allow her to go to less monotheistic religion because according to Islamic belief, 
the the uh, the other religions they are less monotheistic because of Trinity, um, and uh, and, uh, and that's 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 a major issue in the Trinity, uh, Holy Ghost, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. That's totally condemned in the Quran. Mm. So that's why they don't allow to a girl to go from a pure monotheistic deen or religion to a less monotheistic deen. While the uh, Christian and Jews. They are allowed to come in because they are coming into a monothe uh, complete monotheistic mm. uh, religion. But I think Gee. also because the children of the male who is Muslim will be subscribing mm. to their father's mm. faith. So they are Muslim. They are born Muslim. Mm -hmm. Whereas when the woman is marrying to a non-Muslim, their children are going to be non-Muslim. So I that see. again goes back to homogeneity and heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. Changing True. gears a little bit. Dr. Rogers, you are the product of a bicultural marriage. Um, your mom is Afghan and your dad being American. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us, tell us a little bit about how both um, the difficulties and the beauties that you experienced growing up? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, talking, hearing, hearing both of you discuss and share your knowledge about this, um, uh, it's just interesting, um, you know, with my mom marrying an American um, and, you know, speaking to my family members, her, her sisters and brothers, um, uh, because it happened in Afghanistan, um, there was never any, you know, there was never any ruckus or, or you know, condemnation um, about, about this. So, um, you know, I mean, I think thankfully my, my mom um, and her family come from a very educated, you know, um, uh, family, so I think that that was a blessing. I think for her at that time, um, but also just asking my mom, like, how how did you manage that? <laughs> um, and she says it was never even a question. Like, I wanted to marry an American, and that's you know that's my family. I got my father's blessing, my mother's blessing, and that's what I wanted. So, um, as now as a product of the two, um, I think that uh, I I was. You know, I was blessed also to live overseas, um, so I had some kind of disconnection from the Afghan um, community here. For example, in Virginia, I did grow up with them, um, but I uh, I think that for me, uh, the difficulties I had um, had to do. I'm going to go back to what we talked about shame, mm -hmm. um, and I think that I really rebelled against um, all of those standards that I felt pressured, you know, to to. Um, uh, to adopt as my own when I didn't feel like that was authentic for me. So I rebelled a lot about that um, against Afghan culture, against, I would say, I wouldn't say Islam, but more kind of Afghan culture. So I rebelled a lot about that. Um, I didn't fit into, you know, I was like, you know, big into sports when I was, you know, a kid. Um, and that was kind of frowned on a little bit um, in, you know, in the Afghan family. How, you know, how could you send your kid and, you know, your daughter to where, um, you know, to get beat up on a field, you know, with other boys playing, you know, because we're playing co-ed. Um, so, yeah, there was definitely a lot of challenges. Um, however, I will say that as I grew up um, and I have gone through the experience of, of just, you know, solidifying my identity, trying to figure out who I am, um, I really have been, I felt blessed by all of the Afghan cultural elements that I now have allowed um, into my life um, and incorporated into my identity. Um, so I think that it's, you know, it's definitely been a very long and arduous journey for me. Um, but, you know, my, I think another contributing factor is my mother's family was my, fa is my family. Mm -hmm. I don't have an American side mm -hmm. um, at all. So it's just my dad. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a, you know, a huge, huge influence that they've had on me, uh, both good and bad. <laughs> um, but I think that um, the power of the family um, that comes with being an Afghan, I think is beautiful. And it has given me such a source of support um, and identity as well. Um, so I, you know, I think I've kind of come full circle um, from the rebelliousness to this acceptance now. Um, and I, you know, I have, I think also the other thing is I can take little pieces of, of what I like about Afghan culture mm -hmm. and fits with my personality and who I am and my values and leave what I don't, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's kind of been a beauty um, that I've really embraced since I've gotten older. That I think that a lot of okay. Afghans who are both Afghan from both yeah. parents don't get that as, um, as much, so. Thank you so much for sharing mm -hmm. that. I just love hearing personal stories because it makes all these topics that we're talking about so much more mm -hmm. real. Yeah. Um, so for the next question, I would love to know, uh, just a yes or no, should Afghan men and women not even consider marriage until they've moved out of their parents' home and lived on their own for several year years? What do you think? Uh, 
Yes and no. I don't know. It's a hard question. Yes or no. <laughs> um, I would. I'm, I lean more towards yes. Yes. Okay. So yes means yes. They would. They need to know themselves. They need to experience life. That is a absolute yes. So you think they should not consider marriage until they've had that mm -hmm. experience of living in their own for several Absolutely. years. Absolutely. Dr. Yunus, briefly, what is your opinion? Yes, hundred percent agree. Agree that you they know, should you know not each consider other. marriage. You know you are self more when you are alone. Uh, right. Remember, remember, remember a very interesting thing that we came to this world alone, and we will leave this world alone. Right. So sometimes human being, and they need psychologically to be alone. You know, and it's good that we should learn about about ourselves and our values about our needs and can we do it and i mean i 100 percent agree that men and women both should leave their home and have their own apartment in life and conduct their lives so sadly we all come from a war-torn country um, afghanistan has endured so many tragedies and our cultural practices seem to have gone backwards uh, adopting unhealthy elements all of this affects our mental health, which in turn affects our marriage dynamics. Based on your work and observations, and this is a question for all of you, can we say that 100% of Afghans suffer from direct trauma or intergenerational trauma? I would say yes. I, I think, um, you know, even- 100% of Afghans. Yes, I really do. Um, as a, you know, as we, we were talking about, as bicultural, you know, I haven't had, I haven't been to Afghanistan, um, and I have a father who doesn't identify with Afghan culture, um, but I have been impacted by the trauma that my family members, my mom, um, have experienced in Afghanistan. So it was, it was you know, it transferred to me as well, and I felt, I feel, I felt that for a long time. And when I was younger, I didn't, I couldn't identify, I didn't know what it was, mm -hmm. but I always felt its presence in my mm -hmm. life, um, mm -hmm. and I've also seen it. My aunts, my uncles, you know, struggle um, with anxiety, for example, depression. Um, and at the time, again, when I was younger, I didn't know where it came from. I didn't understand it. Um, but I do now, and I absolutely think that um, whether it's direct, um, whether it's passed on down by generation, we're all affected by some level of trauma. What do you think, Dr. Nassad? Yeah. Do you agree that 100% of Afghans Absolutely. suffer either directly or indirectly from intergenerational trauma? Absolutely. If you look at trauma, like refugee trauma, right? There are three phases of trauma, exposure, the possibility. There is a model called triple trauma paradigm. So this starts when the refugees start be be becoming exposed to traumatic events like persecution in their own country and then when they decide to move or escape during that migration there is a chance for them to be tra tra traumatized like with women rape you know attacks uh, torture uh, you know robbery and everything else when they are lucky enough to find a safe heaven then the subsequent trauma can start as a result of acculturation and we know that there is discrimination, there is racism, there is gender, sexism, and everything is that. The host country can also be the, the source of that trauma. So even if my child is born here, they may have been exposed to my narratives of my native country and the way they, they, that, that really makes me uh, feel and I may have raised them in a very depressive kind of way, right? So that carries on. And epigenically, we know now in the field of uh, psychology, science of psychology, that trauma can be transferred into the next generation. And we've seen it in the, during the slavery you know, and the African-American black, but we also have seen it in those, uh, you know, Jude in, 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 in the Jewish community. It's really, really powerful, and we need to do something about it. We need to speak more about this and not put it under the rug. Dr. Yunus, what is your perspective? 100% of Afghans suffer from trauma. Do you agree? I agree, but not 100%, simply because it depends upon how you define trauma. If we define trauma as a disturbing experience, so either direct or intergenerational trauma, that yeah, 100% suffer from either direct uh, or indirect. Uh, direct or indirect. If we define it as disturbing experiences, I agree 100%. But if we define trauma as distressing experiences, I disagree uh, uh, a little bit because. 
um, um, I, 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 I came here and I started to do dishwashing myself, right? And, uh, but uh, I resorted to Islam, you know, and Islam uh, gave me an identity, it gave me culture, it uh, uh, stayed me, uh, st I, I was away from all stress and, and bad experiences because I was resorted to God, right? Mm. I mean, it depends upon your own personal experiences as well. Uh, uh, when you come to this uh, definition of intergenerational uh, uh, issues. But yes, I agree if we experience that, uh, uh, if you define trauma as disturbing experiences, there's very deep, very deep, because uh, the way it is. But again, if we define our, so our social position, if we understand who we are, what 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 is my culture what is my values and these things are defined and then you invest on your own value system i think that uh, intergenerational gap will be disappearing but if if we do not de define this as many afghans does not define their own uh, social position in this country in the west that will be very disturbing a simple yes or no should afghan couples seek therapy prior to marriage. We'll start with you. Yes. Absolutely. And I'm not biased. <laughs> not <laughs> right. at all. <laughs> Dr. Yunus. I, I mentioned before that uh, we have to have pre-marriage counseling. I Absolutely. mean, I don't call it therapy, but pre-marriage counseling. Mm -hmm. That as much as we know through our own experience and studies of these psychological books on family and this and that, we should tell them why they are marrying. What is the purpose of marriage, right? Uh, what is human human equality? And what is the role of a man? And what's the role of a woman? I think uh, pre-marriage counseling, or as you call it, therapy, it's much needed within Afghan culture before they marry. I 100% agree with professors and you and everybody about this. We should, they should, just, all, all, all family counseling uh, uh, organizations should to promote this, we to avoid a, avoid future divorces right? and avoid future problems. We've covered so much ground and I feel like we can go on for hours, uh, but unfortunately our time is running out. You've all been so generous by enlightening us with your expertise. So the last question would be, marriage is getting hard across the board. Um, and when we add in a culture that has endured so much pain and trauma, um, how do you, which the pain and trauma contributes to our marriages, how do you still hold on to hope, hope that a marriage is still even worth it? Absolutely. We need connections. We need uh, stability. We need sustainability to call ourselves humans, right? Mm -hmm. So without human connection, there is no life. There is no continuity of humanity, right? So. But can you have that without a marriage? Not necessarily, because look at what's going on. The social media has disconnected us further and further and further. Every f one in three person is suffering from depression and anxiety. So the social connection, the, the, the idea that to come to a household where there is some stability, to knowing that this is where I belong, this is where my children are growing up, this gives me hope, this gives me purpose in life, right? So, but at the same time, challenges are not bad. We just need to work through those challenges. We need to be able to courageously show up and say, this is not going to work for me unless we work together to do something. I think this is really important because again, going back to capitalistic notion of where we live, there is always this division that's going on and not intentionally, not uh, kind of purposefully, but it's because the notion that says you can do it on your own and you can be competitive and you can do all everything that you reach, but Honestly, this is an illusion. Without family, without uh, marriage, without being in relationship, we don't exist. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rogers? She's so beautifully said. Yeah. You've left all of us yeah. speechless. Yeah. Speechless. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Yunus, is there anything you would like to add? Well, I think uh, uh, in my book, uh, uh, Gender Equality in Islam in 2015, and that book is in 4C, I have written that uh, uh, marriage is a risk. Uh, uh, it's a risk, you know, <laughs> because you can't see it. It's a risk. 
So we have to um, really study what are the risks of a marriage. Uh, and, and that's one thing. And the second thing, there are things that we can control in our lives. We better control it. And there are things that is beyond our control. If it's beyond our control, we have to do the right things. And then those who believe in nature, believe it, believe it for nature. Those who believe in God, believe it, believe it for God. But we have to do the right things. We need to do our homework right. We have to do uh, the uh, risk study, you know. Uh, we don't do these things. And, and I think um, marriage is a good institution. Uh, as long as there is a good communication and consultation and cooperation and, and compromise and trust uh, between a couple, because they are two different, they are two different people, you know, they are not the same. Uh, but um, I, I think that um, it's a good institution as long as they are respect and love and care and understanding each other that the men and women complement each other. Mm -hmm. It has been such an amazing, incredible conversation. I could not have asked for more incredible, brilliant human beings to be amongst mm -hmm. us to share your knowledge and expertise with us. So I wanted to thank you, Dr. Yunus, thank you, Dr. Nasrat, and thank you, Dr. Rogers, for being with us. You've been kind enough to do three shows with us, and we would absolutely love to have each one of you back. Um, and now it is time for our new views. Today's new view, let's simplify everything that's involved with Afghan marriage. From the pre-wedding rituals to the post-wedding reality, let's go back to the basics. Okay, let's start with the pre-wedding stuff first. How many fights have Afghan couples gotten into when it comes to this stuff? Were you one of them? Come on, be honest. Of course, dealing with pre-wedding rituals is difficult for couples all over the world. But Afghan rituals create added stress because there can be so many of them. And they're often not only exhausting, but costly. How many of us go through all of them, simply not to offend our family or our partner's family or both? I was definitely one of them. Let's take a step back. In the Afghanistan of our grandparents' generation, the engagement party was thrown because the man and woman didn't really know each other. It might have been their first meeting or their family's public ceremony that showed the community that these two people were coming together. Do we really need to do that in this day and age when the couple has probably already gotten to know each other through dating? Maybe not. After all, there's the initial love ceremony that often serves that purpose nowadays, right? So why can't we just have that and do away with the engagement party? Wouldn't that allow more breathing room for the couple to plan a simple but meaningful wedding? And are the day after or night before wedding parties really needed anymore? First of all, many people become exhausted by back-to-back -back nights of partying. And why waste all of that money that can be saved for the honeymoon or building a home together? And let's remember that you don't have to invite the entire world to your wedding. Thanks in part to the impact of the pandemic, Afghans have become more comfortable with smaller weddings and I am all for it. My point is, we're bogged down by old formalities that are in desperate need of re-examinations. There are some unnecessary traditions that are no longer rich in meaning. They're just costly in price. Now I know the real challenges start after the I do's, when the couple moves past the wedding and heads into the marriage. Then real life hits like a ton of bricks. That was certainly the case for me. Marriages across the board are facing increasing challenges and threats, no matter the country or culture. But Afghan marriages can be tougher due to heavier burdens of family obligations and traditional expectations that were easier to uphold in the Afghanistan of a completely different era. Nowadays, have you heard complaints thrown at the wife or husband like, why doesn't she cook? Why don't they come over more often? Why isn't he making enough money? Oh, the list can go on and on. Sometimes we place these burdens and expectations on ourselves out of fear of letting anyone down. So we try to be the image of perfection at the cost of exhaustion. We try to make it to every family gathering or to every party on top of trying to host some of our own. 
Meeting all of these obligations sometimes leaves us feeling wiped out and resentful. And if you're part of a bicultural marriage, that has its own unique challenges because you're faced with having to explain or justify certain rituals that might not make sense to your spouse. Adding to the pressure, Afghan marriages, like all marriages, are bombarded with the facade of social media. These images portray the perfect couple, the perfect wedding, the perfect house or family or whatever. It's almost debilitating, all while trying to build a solid foundation with your significant other in a way that is meaningful and soulful. My point is, keep it simple. Be honest with your families about the stresses you face and how you need their help instead of added pressure. Set the expectations kindly with love instead of waiting until an argument ensues. If we don't get back to the basics with our wedding rituals and marriage expectations, we could risk facing serious consequences to our mental health that could take years to recover from. In the process, we'll grow resentful towards our culture, families, and heritage, each of which has a lot of richness to offer, despite some of the burdens. Afghan wedding traditions and marriage obligations don't need to disappear. They simply need to evolve and adapt so that they can survive, so that your children would want to continue them. And if they don't, your son or daughter might grow up seeing how tired and angry these rituals made mom and dad, and they will almost certainly abandon them. Again, keep it simple in expectations, light in attitude, and rich in meaning. Above all, be brave and kind when doing so. And as a final note, before you get married, please consider taking part in premarital counseling with your partner. That kind of therapy can lay the groundwork for having vulnerable and uncomfortable conversations with your spouse in a safe space that's guided by an expert. Remember, every individual comes with their own unique experiences, challenges, beliefs, traumas, and family dynamics. We are all beautifully complex people, and we're fortunate enough to be living in a new era that offers resources to help us better understand these complexities. Don't be afraid to take advantage of them. Well, I hope we challenge some boundaries and comfort zones in your household today. A sincere thanks to you and to our wonderful panelists for joining us. I am your host, Naeed Jahed, for Tuti, Khadafiz for now.